Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes, okay, good. I know that Trini will be uploading my slides. So, thank you. Once again, thank you, Chairwoman, Chairwoman Moore, and thank you to Lisa Holder, Don Tamaki, and all members of the task force to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. I also want to thank Alicia Turner and Trini Hurtado for their work ensuring that logistically I was able to give, I was set to give expert testimony today. Surely the effort to recognize and repay the debt owed to Black American descendants of slaves demonstrates justice in its truest form. As the introduction said, my name is Yeshima Bet Milner. I'm the founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. We are a movement of over 20,000 scientists and activists working to make data a tool for social change instead of a weapon of political oppression. I started Data for Black Lives because for far too long, data has been weaponized against black communities. Because the bullets, police dogs, and fire hoses of the past have become the predictive policing, data-driven voter suppression, and facial recognition of the present. You can go to the next slide, Trini, thank you. My testimony is foregrounded in our call to action to abolish big data. If you wanna learn more about this, you can find my talks online on YouTube or on our website. But briefly today, it is a call to action that recognizes that the big data systems that are becoming implemented and normalized are not novel or innovative or revolutionary at all, but they are a part of a long and pervasive historical legacy and technological timeline of scientific oppression, aggressive public policy, and the most influential political and economic system that has and continues to shape this country's economy, chattel slavery. I believe that what we face today and we must name is a data industrial complex where zip code is destiny, debt becomes a ball and chain weaponized by complex and obscure financial systems that I'll talk about later, where data is a strategy to rob people of political power by manipulating elections, a system where the persistent, archaic, and racist notions of risk persist, narratives that are more powerful and impenetrable than any prison cell or shackles or holds that could ever be built. And go to the next slide. In my testimony today, I'll be discussing how the notions of risk that actually originated in the slave trade through insurance agencies and, and other slave finance have come today to foreground the black box algorithms and other data enabled technologies that unless we fight for sweeping policy change like reparations, we will repeat history and actually usher in some of the most violent and human and civil rights assaults of our lifetime. To bring it personally, the very first time I even heard the term at risk was in the fourth grade. Another student, coincidentally in our elementary school's computer lab, told me that she was at risk. Immediately just hearing the word elicited a sense of fear and worry in me as a nine-year-old. I asked her what she meant. She told me that she was enrolled in an after-school program for at-risk students, for kids who are at risk of going to prison, of having unwanted pregnancy or joining a gang. Of course, she liked the after-school program, but it was as if the lack of funding of our, at our under-resourced, predominantly black and immigrant school offered limited options for extracurricular activities, as well as very narrow options for what and who we could become. And this became a self-fulfilling prophecy. While I myself and others survived the school to prison pipeline, many of my peers did not, as they not only had to fight to overcome the, the material circumstances of their lives, but also the narratives and stereotypes that, that continued to criminalize them. You can go to the next slide. Thank you so much. So this is an example of one of my favorite forms of machine learning used to power autocorrect and synonyms in most text editing software. In this, we see the connotations of risk, danger, jeopardy, hazard, gamble, probability, menace. Again, how did this term used primarily in business originating in the slave trade, insurance, loss prevention, and in finance become a label oper operationalized through policy and weaponized against young people, children, and young people like myself and my friend. 
With the end of the civil rights movement, the war on drugs or the war on communities as we call it, and with the introduction of massive legislation for mass in, in support of mass incarceration, came a wave of research and data to justify the targeted and coordinated effort to warehouse entire communities into prisons. You can go to the next slide, thank you. Super Predator was introduced by social scientist and Bush administration advisor John Dulo in 1995. Julio created a whole theory around the notion that a new generation of street criminals is upon us. The youngest, biggest, and baddest generation anyone has ever seen and known. Based on all that we have witnessed, researched, and heard from people who are close to the action, he wrote, here is what we believe. America is now home to thickening ranks of juvenile super predators, radically impulsive, brutally remorseless youngsters who rape, murder, assault, rob, burglarize, deal drugs, and create serious communal disorders. You can go to the next slide, thank you. Of course, none of this was true. The data in fact showed that crime was decreasing across the board at this time. And John DeLulio would go on to refute his research and his racist claims and become Catholic as you all can see in this article here. But of course, by this time, the cat was out the bag. And of course, John DeLulio was not alone. Go, you can go to the next slide. In the 1980s, well before Super Predator, Dr. Ira Chasnoff built an entire career off of the crack baby myth, which was based on a flimsy study consisting of only 23 participants. Of course, his hypothesis was lockstep with the most racist political intentions, a fear that one day a generation of children will grow up to be crack addicted and a burden to civil society. All of this was wrong, and the study should have been refuted based on the sample size alone. But it was not, and the myth persisted, even though, again, the reality was opposite. One of the babies from the study grew up to be a healthy, functional, and quite exceptional young woman, the first in her family to graduate from college. It was found that poverty, rather than crack addiction, which then was a proxy for blackness, was found to be more harmful in a child's life. You can go to the next slide, thank you. Similarly, the welfare queen myth was used and continues to be used to dismantle our country's safety net, fight against cash payment for, for reparations, privatize social services, and siphon money away from the very communities who need them and who pay for them with taxpayer dollars. Meanwhile, the real welfare queens are the ones who benefit, are, are the corporations who benefit more from government subsidies than all individual welfare recipients combined. You can go to the next slide, thank you. So before we can talk about what an algorithm is, we have to talk about what goes into it. Of course, input data and output scores, recommendations, but above that history and values. To define an algorithm, by definition, it is a set of step-by-step -step instructions to solve a problem. A recipe is an algorithm. A list of instructions or a process to make the dish, the ingredients that make up the dish, and the result based on what we define from the, from the beginning of the recipe as a success. Whether we wanna make something that's healthy or something that tastes good, regardless of health benefits, the decisions are determined by a question. What are we optimized? What are we optimizing, excuse me? Computational algorithms are layered, complicated. Their ingredients are not just raw data that is fed into them, and the result is not as simple as the outputs that come out of them. Scores, ratios, GPS routes, or even Netflix recommendations. But again, as this chart demonstrates, history and values are what influence inputs and outputs, and most importantly, the very models that are trained and developed, the algorithms themselves. One example are FICO credit scores. Contrary to popular belief, FICO is not a federal agency, but the Fair and Isaac Company, a for-profit entity started by William Fair and Earl Isaac, a mathematician and engineer who 25 years ago sought to disrupt the risk and lending industry through the use of machine learning. The inputs to the FICO algorithm, as we are told, are the amount of debt we have, the percentage of missed payments, et cetera. And this information, our data, are provided through the collusion of data brokers. We know them as Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. And then fed into the FICO algorithm and out of the algorithm comes our score. And while we are told that certain behaviors 
and financial characteristics comprise our credit score, we aren't able to verify because FICO is a proprietary algorithm. It's a black box, devoid of transparency and with the purpose of displacing accountability away from the for-profit the, the for companies that profit from our data um, at our expense. And also FICO scores reflect the ways in which algorithms hold tremendous power over our lives, even though we have no recourse. Right at this very moment, there are students that will have to drop out of school because they cannot qualify for subsidized student loans. There are people who are struggling to afford rising public transportation costs because they can't afford subprime car payments and even hardworking families facing homelessness because they cannot qualify to rent an apartment all because of a three digit number. And these three digit numbers are, it will increasingly decide whether we should get hired for the job and maybe even someday, if even whether we'll be able to vote. And while it is in violation of federal law to deny people housing, employment, and education based on race, you can't sue an algorithm. And private companies like FICO, who I must also mention, it is in their best interest to ensure that some people have low scores and others don't, argue that their algorithms don't discriminate. They say nowhere in that, in that algorithm or in their input is race a variable. And there's so much research that also indicates the ways in which even when you control in different neighborhoods, such as there was a study done in Illinois for income and for education and, and, and the amount of death, black folks in some zip codes had much lower scores than white folks in other zip codes, even when controlling for those other factors. Because we know that based on the history of our country, you can go to the next slide, thank you so much, Trini, how our neighborhoods and our municipalities are organized you don't even need to use race as a variable. When redlining and segregation, the legacy of slavery, have made zip codes proxies for race. And this is a history that I think everyone on the call knows. But only seven generations after slavery, six million African Americans left the South for the industrial centers of the North, Midwest, and West Coast of his country in a, in a, in a historical moment known as the Great Black, Great Black Migration. As black people contributed tremendously to the growth of the manufacturing industry and to the culture and politics of metropolitan life, our federal government responded through policies that sought to institutionalize racist sentiments and permanently entrench black communities in a case-like status. Policies that were foregrounded in the most essential part of economic mobility in the US, home ownership. You can go to the next slide, thank you again. In 1933, as part of the New Deal, the Homeowners Loan Corporation developed a grading system that deemed some areas desirable while others hazardous. These areas were largely minority areas, many black, and today 74% of the areas deemed hazardous, quote unquote, according to, according to this grading system, in 1933 re remain today low income, under-resourced, and neglected. It did not matter that federal law ruled racial zoning unconstitutional, real estate boards, neighborhood association, at, associations, and white mob violence made it possible for black, made it impossible for black people to own homes and were deeply invested into turning these communities into sacrifice zones. And this is a map of Oakland for an example I'm, I'm gonna use now, but it's amazing how zip codes created in the 20th century to organize the country around post or for the postal for the postal service have become digital artifacts of this history, encoding this history and therefore extending the shelf life on the racist public policies of the past. You can go to the next slide. I saw how notions of risk, how the impact of zip codes, and how even these maps became again present. Um, as a young organizer in Oakland, California. I was a youth organizer at an organization in the summer of 2009 at the height of the foreclosure crisis. Part of my job was to do data collection for a survey led by Just Cause Oakland, my internship site, along with the Alameda County Health Department to document and expose the effect of foreclosures and evictions on the health of residents. This is a chart that, uh, from the report that we developed. In 1980, 47% of Oakland was black. Today, according to the 2020 census, black people make up less than 24% of Oakland's population. Although the population of the city itself has been growing for years, 
How did it happen that since 2010, with over 50 new white and Hispanic Oakland residents have moved into Oakland and have been able to take advantage of opportunities of being in a booming metropolitan hub, while the black families that built the city and laid roots were forced to leave the city in droves. And one way that I witnessed firsthand was through the targeting of black communities through the complex financial schemes that resulted in the foreclosure crisis of 2010. In addition to my role doing data collection that summer, my job was to also organize residents in West Oakland to stand with their neighbors against the banks. And I love that somebody brought up the banks. I think uh, Ms. Kelly Ferris, I wrote your name down. In the event of a foreclosure eviction, which were happening daily, every day, I met with residents who had fallen victim to predatory lenders, who with the promise of more affordable mortgages or a second mortgage to help cover medical bills or pay for renovations and repairs, were aggressively targeted for subprime, subprime predatory lending. Next slide. People like Miss Elizabeth, whose family had left the sharecropping conditions of the South to come to California, a state that held the promise of opportunity that was not possible in the South and much harder to achieve in the cold and racist North. Miss Elizabeth's husband found work in the West Oakland Navy Yard like so many other black men born only a generation away from slavery. The Victorian house that they bought and where she and her husband raised their children and even their grandchildren was seized in only nine months after a nice representative, quote unquote, from the bank visited her daily, promising that with a second mortgage, which they said she qualified for, she'd be able to pay back medical bills that piled up since her husband's death and even leave some cash for her children to do necessary renovations. She was told that all these payments would be well under the amount she received monthly from social security and pensions. But they did not tell her that she was given an adjustable rate mortgage and that her mortgage would balloon in months to far from what she could afford, making payments too expensive and causing her to default on her payments and lose her home. As you can see in the map, the rate of defaults, as well as where we see the, the, the hazardous mapping definitely overlays. It shows a trend and it shows the, the extent of the targeting as well. And they definitely did not tell Miss Elizabeth that her mortgage was being repackaged with other mortgages and pooled together in these complex and obscure financial schemes to securitize and then re-securitize credit, as credit default swaps. And that there was a lot of money being made by banks and hedge funds betting on her inability to be able to pay for this adjustable rate mortgage. When black families all across California and all over the US settled their belongings into storage units, closed the doors in their mother's or father's home for the last time, or like Miss Angela, another leader I worked with became sick from legal battles with Wachovia Bank because her home was defaulted due to robo signed documents. They literally had an automated system that signed people's documents to push forward default and foreclosure. But all this happened, bank executives and hedge fund managers walked away with a slap on the wrist, millions in bonuses, and have even been since awarded with positions in the former and present political uh, presidential administration. In fact, if the federal government is ever in need of an example, how to redistribute cash payments, and in a large amount, they should look no further than 2009. Big banks that were deemed too big to fail were given the biggest bailout and the biggest example of reparations I think we'd ever seen under the Dodd-Frank Act to the tune of trillions. In fact, we are still calculating exactly how much money banks received. While people like Miss Angela, Miss Elizabeth, and all the people that I worked with that summer in Oakland lost their homes permanently. The foreclosure crisis was a man-made crisis against black families, black home ownership, and black stability. You can go to the next slide, thank you, Trini. And today, there are many other examples of how notions of risk are being perpetuated through black box algorithms and weaponized against black communities. I know my co-panelists will likely provide more context on others, but if we look at this theme of risk more, we see we see this evident in risk assessment questionnaires, where instead of jury and, and instead of judges, people are being sentenced to time based on questions like, were you suspended? Or does a hungry person have a right to steal? Knowing that with a question like suspension, in many counties and, and states, black students are 
eight or nine ten times more likely to be suspended than, than their white peers, not because they're bad kids, but because of racist entrenched pra practices and policies in schools. In the area of car insurance, we see here that um, this is a map in of, of Chicago. On the, on the left here is the homeowner loan corporation map, and on the right is, is a map in, in the dark pink where, where people have to pay the highest premiums. Literally, people are paying, people in black neighborhoods are paying more on insurance premiums, even though there's less crime than folks who live in wealthier, whiter, more downtown areas. Next slide, please. And it's even getting into the health. This is an article from an investigation that I think is still going on with United Health and their algorithm that literally used cost of care or how much people are able to spend on care to determine health risk and therefore care needs. Of course, this algorithm, which was used on hundreds of millions of, of patients, neglected and denied care to black patients who are more at risk. Because again, we live in a country where who has the health insurance to be able to pay out more for care? Not black folks, white folks and other folks. And this is another example of the way in which an interesting way, in this case, black people were more at risk, but it was used to deny them care. You can go to the next slide, thank you. But we also, to kind of conclude and wrap up, remember, as folks in our network always say, Black Americans arrived here on balance sheets, and, them, and they themselves, us, we were collected for, as collateral for debt owed. And so none of these practices are surprising, but they should inspire urgency. Uh, you can go to the next slide. This is one example that I like to show in my presentations and research of a balance sheet uh, used by a slave plantation in British Guyana, where actually my family uh, were enslaved and where we're fighting for reparations there. Um, and literally, there was a line for each day in columns for many types of categories of enslaved men, women, and children. They include in the field, watchmen, house servants, carpenters, children, invalids, runaways. The daily process of dehumanization was deeply numerical. Right below these abstracts were identical reports for livestock. The Negro account and livestock account use the same methods of taking an inventory, calculating increase and decrease, purchase, sale, birth, with little difference made for man, woman, child, oxen, goat, and cattle. And of course, it's not lost on me that the name of this plantation was also called Hope and Experiment. One person mentioned that J.P. Morgan Chase, and it's true. J.P. Morgan Chase is currently the biggest bank in the U.S admitted that its subsidiaries accepted enslaved people as collateral for loans. So we're talking about loans, we're talking about payment, we're talking about default. If plantation owners defaulted on loan payment, the bank took ownership of enslaved Africans. And J.P. Morgan was not alone. The other predecessors made up, their predecessors made up Citibank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and a whole list of other financial firms. You can go to the next slide. And finally, to conclude, I want to wrap it up so I have time for other folks to speak. The story of Black Americans, slavery, and algorithmic discrimination, again, what we are fighting against is not new, but you can really literally pull a, a, a thread through all of these events in history over the last four to 500 years. And as the late civil rights scholar, Lady Guinier wrote, Black folks in America, when it comes to algorithmic discrimination, are like miners in a canary, miners canaries. Miners often carry the canary into the mine alongside them. The canary's more fragile respiratory system would cause it to collapse from noxious gases long before humans were affected, thus alarming miners to, to danger. The, the canary's distress signaled that it was time to get out of the mine because the air was becoming too poisonous to breathe. As she writes, those who are racially marginalized are like the miners' canaries. Their distress is the first sign of danger that threatens us all. It is easy to think of that when we sacrifice this canary, the only harm is to other communities of color. Yet others ignore problems that converge around racial minorities at their own peril, for these problems are synonymous warning that we are all at risk. 
At Data for Black Lives, we fully support cash payments and sweeping policy changes in support of a reparations agenda. And we, we believe that this has to be done not only to repair the harm done and what has been taken and lost, but we must do it in order to secure the civil and human rights for Black Americans and literally everyone else in the age of big data. To abolish big data means to dismantle the structures that concentrate the power in the hands of a few and to put it in the hands of those who need it the most. At Data for Black Lives, our mission is to reclaim data as power, as protest, and as collective action. Thank you.